of the Van Gogh series. Uh, we're going to be looking at this book, right? And it is written by um, Martin Bailey, right? And the whole idea is to see whether the mainstream version of the Van Gogh story is is accurate. In other words, the story that we've all been, I don't want to say led to believe, but certainly the story that we all are familiar with is that um, reasonable, is it likely what happened? Um, and from a true crime perspective, does it make sense? Or is there a, a, a better explanation? Is there a more reasonable explanation? And by the way, the whole idea that you know, did Van Gogh commit suicide or was he murdered? I didn't come up with that. I didn't sort of go, I'm going to invent some kind of controversy about Van Gogh. It's actually been going on for quite a long time, I would say, uh, at least 10 years, uh, arguably twice as long and maybe even longer. So in this episode, we're actually going to deal with Van Gogh's funeral um, I see there are not any members right now in chat, so I can't really ask you guys where you think Dr. Gachet was, but Dr. Gachet was Vincent van Gogh's um, doctor in Orvez, who was the place where he spent the last summer of his life. And so you had the situation where van Gogh, whether he was shot or whether he'd shot himself, he was in a situation where he was mortally injured for 30 hours, right? And so the question is, during those 30 hours, where, where is his doctor, right? Now, it's not like um, he had some mysterious doctor and we don't know who it was. Even before he went to Orvez, who was when he transferred from the asylum, um, it was sort of arranged that this doctor would be there for him and that this doctor would sort of look after him, look after his mental health um, and just sort of take him under his wing. So here you have a situation where Do um, Vincent van Gogh is actually dying. Everybody knows it. His doctor knows it. His doctor's already been to see him. And then um, where's the doctor subsequent to that? Hi, Stephanie. So, so uh, what happens to the doctor, his doctor, his personal doctor? Timmy, can you calm down? What happens to his doctor when you... Um, so, anyway, Stephanie, I'm afraid I can't sort of un, unlive it because I'm, I'm not on StreamYard. So, unfortunately, it's, it's too late now. Um, but there are at least two more episodes. The one is on, um, what's it? Um, the very next episode is deals with Martin Bailey putting up, is it suicide or is it murder? So, yeah, so um, unfortunately it's just too late. Um, otherwise I would have sort of stopped this live. It's, it'll take another 10 or 20 minutes. Um, I would like to do it, but unfortunately it's a bit... Bit too late. Uh, good to see you, Yvonne. Um, okay, cool. So anyway, just to come back to the point, um, his personal doctor also knows that, you know, like if you asked Dr. Gachet and you said, is Vincent van Gogh your patient? He would have said, yes, Vincent van Gogh's my patient. So yeah, yeah you actually have his patient dying, literally um, uh, you know, living the last hours of his life. And then you, you say, so where was Dr. Gachet when this happened? So number one, Dr. Gachet is aware of it. And number two, Dr. Gachet is his doctor. And number three, where is the doctor when Vincent van Gogh is dying, right? And you might sort of make the argument that it's sort of a fait accompli, um, there's nothing the doctor can do and the doctors sort of, you know, um, uh, give us some privacy kind of thing. But let me ask you, if you were a family member, 
if you were a family member and your um, relative was in this critical condition, would you say to the doctor, um, just, yeah, can you just go somewhere else? Like, can you just leave the hospital? Can you just sort of disappear for a while? Would you, would you think you would say that? Um, so that's really the, the, the crazy part of what you're talking about. So I'm going to deal with the chapter in a moment. Um, I just want to show you guys this brochure. This actually comes from the Revue Inn when I visited there in 2019, May 2019. He died in July. He, was, he sustained the, the gunshot on the 27th of July. I think he died on the 29th or the 30th of July. I should actually know. Um, but, uh, yeah, around right about 24 hours later, um, he died at the end of July. Um, so, yeah, so, so this comes from the Revue Inn. And that's just giving you a little bit of an idea of what it looks like on the inside sort of been restored the way that it was, 29th of July. And, yeah, it just basically, there is also the interior where you can see, you know, you go up the stairs and then there is um, there's the room. And it's kind of a fairly spartan room. It's sort of got a chair and a bed in it. And... Um, I don't know if you guys want me to read what it says here. Um, it says, Oves was in the footsteps of Van Gogh. Oves is for really gravely beautiful. It's the heart of the countryside, distinctive and picturesque. More than a century later, the painter's first impression of the area still rings true. Just 30 kilometers from Paris, Oves was has remained a charming and peaceful artist colony that captivated Van Gogh and so many others. At the heart of the village, the Auberge Orbe Revue, known since 1926 as the House of Van Gogh, harbors the last room of Vincent, suffused with emotions and memories. After your visit, take the time to stroll through the many alleyways of the village, discover the church. The church, by the way, is just behind um, the, uh, it's sort of literally, one or two minutes walk behind the um, Ravu Inn. Um, then it says, step into the innermost world of Van Gogh. It says, in the attic of the Ravu Inn, a single skylight lets a few rays of sunshine into the room number five where Vincent lived and died. Out of sheer superstition, this garret, referred to as the suicide room, was never rented out again since 1890. In this well-preserved site, there's nothing to see, but in his empty room, you can relate and bond with the painter's psyche. So it's quite weird. It's almost like looking, when you see the room that Van Gogh stayed in, it's almost like looking at a, a blank white canvas. And so what you tend to do is you project your, yourself onto it, in a sense. It says, um, to fully take in the experience, you may wish to consider... Visiting this enclave of silence on a weekday, you will grasp the sentiment of one of our visitors who thanked us for transforming the glory of Van Gogh into an intimate experience. While staying at the Auberge Revue, Vincent confided in his brother Theo, someday or other I believe I will find a way to have my own exhibition in a cafe. In partnership with the Auberge Revue, the Institute Van Gogh first refurbished and preserved the painter's world and is now working to make Van Gogh's dream come true, bringing someday or other one of his Auberge paintings back to the room where it dried. The seven square meter attic room without a view will thus become the smallest museum in the world, exclamation mark. Uh, Nisi uh, says, yeah, only a few minutes late. Good to have you here. Then this refers to the dining room at the Revue Inn. 
Thanks to its meticulous restoration, the Revue Inn, now a designated historical landmark, has regained its look and feel of 1890. I actually had a meal there. I sort of um, booked a uh, seat there and I actually sat there and I felt quite a lot like Van Gogh was eating by myself and there were other people, couples and whatever, and um, I was sort of looking at all of this from the outside. I thought, I think I'm having a more authentic Van Gogh experience than what they are. Um, it says um, there are wine racks, embroidered curtains, a tin counter, and oak tables, all plunges back, back into the home-like atmosphere of yesteryear's cafes. The menu features traditional food, popular recipes, and home cooking. It's very good, and all of a sudden, life becomes a much precious gift. And is that it? The last page refers to opening times. Um, by car, you can take the motorway A15 to Pontoir, and then you take that exit by train. You go from Saint Lazare or Gare de Nord in in Paris to Pontoir, then um, you get off at Auvers, um, and then they just talk about the the, the hours: early March, late November, um, and there's also an audio visual show. So I also attended that. That's sort of all in this little booklet. This is the the painting they have sort of on the cover of that booklet, the one about where he said he's painting extreme loneliness kind of thing. And, you know, st I guess storms over or troubled skies over the wheat fields or something. Um, Yvonne says, it seems as if they wanted to preserve the room as a memorial of him. Yvonne says, what did you eat? I can't really remember. I just know it was a traditional meal. I think it was something like a beef stew, something like that. Um, uh, the French have got another name for beef. Um, if Bria was here, she would be able to say. Um, it was. It, I would give the meal a six and a half out of ten. It was. It was. Um, it was so-so. It wasn't great and it wasn't terrible, just sort of ordinary. Um, but it was quite special given where it was. It was more the atmosphere of the meal than the meal itself. Um, Amy Hall, good to see you here as well. Okay, so Timmy, can I get rid of you? <laughs> I need to open this book. Timmy, can you not be so codependent? Okay, off you go. Are you, are you down there? Huh? <laughs> hey? To me? Uh, I don't know whether you guys, uh, well, you probably don't know this, but just before I came on, I actually took the garbage out and I was about to unlock the gate and there was a, a strange object about this size. And I sort of first thought it was a leaf or something, then I thought it's a mole, and then I realized it's actually a bat. And I sort of came really close to it. I was probably sort of this far from it, like a quarter of a meter, and, I, and then I realized it's actually upside down. It's actually hanging upside down. It's got tiny little feet. And I don't know what the problem was. I, I, it has been raining a lot, so I don't know whether the bat was cold, but it's been anyway, quite odd. And I, I sort of thought, I'm not going to unlock the gate to take the garbage out because, you know, I felt it would disturb the bat. Also, I didn't really want the bat flying in my face kind of thing. So kind of quite weird. Um, but it kind of looked like quite a, looked like a quite a small mouse, um, very furry, very small. Um, and I was, as I was coming close and close, I was like, where are your wings? Um, but they sort of tucked in the side. Um, Amy says, is Timmy in Nick's arms? Well, he was lying sort of cradled, um, but he no longer is because I need to be going through this. 
Uh, okay, so um, we're now on page 127 of Martin Bailey's book, and we're dealing with this chapter, Funeral, right? And it's from this book, uh, Van Gogh's Finale, and I'm just going to read the first paragraph or so from this chapter, chapter 16. Um, and so Martin Bailey writes, Theo sat alone beside the body of his brother as its warmth ebbed away. The 13 hours he had spent with Vincent would have been hugely traumatic, and by now he was exhausted both emotionally and physically. Towards dawn, he made his way downstairs to tell Ravu the terrible news. Another messenger was dispatched to Dr. Gachet, quite possibly again Hershig, who had slept only fitfully in the adjacent room. The doctor arrived swiftly and went upstairs to attend to Vincent's body. Hershig never forgot the distressing scene. With the mouth wide open, as if he was still groaning, the doctor closed his eyes and took the blankets off his body, and then he lay naked with a small red hole in his side. Later that morning, Dr. Gachet found a stick of charcoal, probably one of Vincent's, and sketched a deathbed portrait. And so um, my question is sort of, where was Dr. Gachet when Vincent van Gogh died? And the answer is he wasn't there. So you kind of got to kind of ask the question again. So Dr. Gachet has been expressly appointed as Vincent van Gogh's doctor. He sustains a gunshot wound. He comes and goes, and then he's not even around when he dies. It's not like he, he comes, attends to him, and then sort of goes home to fetch more equipment or more medicine or... I don't know, does a little bit of research quickly or goes to fetch a scalpel or, you know, he, he sort of goes home to, he, he seems to sort of just go home and I'm not coming back. Um, if, if you call me, I'll come back. But if you don't call me, I'm not going to come back. Um, don't you find that a bit odd? Don't you, don't you find that a bit ridiculous? Amy says, I never did purchase the book, but I love listening to next chat and readings. Uh, Nisi says not too attentive for a doctor. So this is the part that's really crazy is, um, so Theo spends 13 hours with, with his brother. Much of those 13 hours, it's just him and his brother. It's just the two of them. And the doctor's not there. And um, then... After he dies, then the doctor does come there, and then he, and then the doctor's around a lot. Then the doctor's around a lot. It's like, okay, so while Vincent's in pain and dying, I don't really have anything to do. I, I, what can I do? I'm a doctor. What, 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 what can I do? But after he's dead, oh, no, 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 now I've got a lot to do. Now I want to draw a picture of him. Now I want to um, do X, Y, and Z, and... Uh, Martin Bailey sort of uh, deals with the fact that Dr. Gachet was someone who did autopsy, so did he do an autopsy? Now, bear in mind, it's kind of like this warped argument of Dr. Gachet saying, oh, hell no, I'm not going to take the bullet out of his body, but, oh, when he's dead, okay, when he's dead, I'll take the bullet out of his body. Or certainly that's certainly what's being um uh, kind of addressed. It's not clear whether the bullet was taken out or not. But you've actually got a doctor who um, is capable of doing that, but he, instead of doing that, he ends up drawing a picture. It's kind of quite difficult to... Um, no, he f he slept fitfully in the adjacent room refers to Hershik, right? That refers to another artist. Um, the doctor wasn't sleeping in an adjacent room because it says here um, 
another messenger was sent to to, to Dr. Gachet, possibly Hershig, Hershig who had stepped fitfully in the adjacent room. The doctor arrived swiftly. So in other words, the doctor was somewhere else. Does, does that make sense? Um, and, and so, or do you think that I'm mistaken there? What do you think? Do you think I've misunderstood? <clears throat> yeah, I don't think you would say the doctor arrived swiftly if the doctor was in the room next door. I don't think you'd be like, they asked the doctor to come to Vincent and then he, he arrived swiftly from the room next door. I don't think you would say that. Um, in any event, um, Hershey sees the scene of the doctor closing his eyes and taking the blankets off and and then Vincent is lying naked with a, with a small hole in his side. Now, I must say I can empathize with the whole situation, meaning I've just really, you know, broken a rib and it's on the one side of my body and um, I can kind of understand how, you know, if obviously Vincent was shot sort of in the rib area, um, I can understand that it would be difficult to turn in his bed, it would be difficult to stand up um, one can even anticipate that it would be he would need assistance possibly going to the restroom, right? And one wonders what, I mean, that's not even sort of addressed, but one wonders what that's all about. I also think someone took his clothes off. So, someone, his clothes were probably covered in blood, but, but probably um, someone helped take his clothes off. But I can, I can really imagine that he... Um, would have struggled to, he wouldn't really have wanted to move much um, because of where, the, where that, that injury was. Almost like a rib injury, but of, of course it's a bullet that's torn through lots of different tissues. And so it's not just um, the location of it, it's also, you know, he's lost a lot of blood and all that kind of thing. Um, but it, it just kind of made me think... Um, would he not have needed to, in, in 30 hours, would he not have needed to kind of get up and go to the restroom? Um, probably. Um, and somebody probably helped him, maybe to his brother, but that's not like disclosed, right? Um, so, so I've kind of just written next to this paragraph, where is he? In other words, where's the doctor? Answer is not around. Why? Did he have better things to do? Um, all of this happened sort of overnight. Vincent van Gogh died at dawn. So it wasn't as though, no, I'm at my practice. Um, and so it, it, it once again is a bit odd. Um, it's a bit odd that the doctor comes and comes, stays very briefly, leaves again, and they've got to call him back again. Um, Then it says here, um, this is Martin Bailey's words. He says that he sketched a deathbed portrait. He said it is an act of homage, which underlines his esteem for him and the bond that the two had forged during the previous weeks. Now, I read that and I'm kind of like, my eyebrows sort of go up because it's kind of like, so, so after he dies, because he's got so much respect for him, he sketches him, but when he's alive, he says nothing to him or barely says a word to him. Also says there's nothing we can do um, and also kind of doesn't stick around. He isn't, he's supposed to actually be his, his only real friend in Norvez. It's kind of supposed to be, um, I painted Dr. Gachet's portrait. I painted his daughter's portrait. Um, we got invited to to lunch at his home. Now, but now that I'm dying, oh, sorry, the doctor's got lots of other things to do. He can't spend too much time, you know, at somebody's deathbed. Well, his job's a doctor. And so it's like this weird thing of, oh, oh but after he's died, now I'm going to spend some time 
sitting next to your bed um, drawing your portrait. I don't know, there's something completely grotesque about it and also like for this research who's writing about it, it's like, do, do you realize that this doesn't quite make sense? You're saying, oh, he did this out of homage. Well, where was the homage when you were still alive, right? Um, Nisi, that's exactly right. She, she, it's like, you're going to die. I'll be back to sketch you soon uh, after you're dead. You know, when you're dead, I'll come back and then I'll draw your picture. Um, anyway, take care. Bye bye. Bye bye now, kind of thing. Um, Yvonne says, Gachet is busy somewhere else tidying up the crime scene question mark. Well, that's quite a good point. Did he have actually quite important other things to do? Uh, did he need to go and speak to his son and daughter? You know, this is how we're going to handle this. Stephanie says it's degrading, humiliating to Vincent. Uh, he sketches him as he lay naked and showing the side with a mutilated ear. Jumping a little bit ahead, but that is true. Um, Yvonne says, I hate that death portrait. It doesn't even look like him. Um, but remember we spoke earlier about the fact that Dr. Gachet's garden kind of had bones tumbling into it from the sort of one end of the garden. The one end of the garden sort of backed into a cemetery. And so every now and then you'd like to have a skull lying in the garden and, and every now and then they would bring a skull indoors and that would be part of the sort of, I don't want to say decor of the house, but part of the inside of the house. So death wasn't like this weird thing. It was kind of like something that Dr. Gachet seemed oddly familiar with or even um, troublingly familiar with. Um, so here's the other part that to me is a bit odd. Instead of Dr. Gachet um, drawing this picture and signing it Dr. Gachet, Dr. Paul Gachet, he signs it Paul Van Rysel, which is kind of his artist name. So it's almost like, it's all, like in a weird way, Dr. Gachet is like, it's almost like Superman and Clark Kent. Dr. Gachet, when he arrives back at Vincent van Gogh's bedside, he suddenly become the artist again. It's just like, um, cuckoo, you're a doctor, um, you know, Anyway, and so he writes, and he also doesn't write Vincent van Gogh, he writes V van Gogh. So he's already almost sort of dissociating himself from this person. It's now, okay, so the person I'm writing is V van Gogh, and I'm signing this Paul van Rysel, which isn't actually even his name. It's a, it's a pseudonym for an artist. It's a little bit bizarre, right? Um Then it says here that Dr. Gesher also made a second, smaller version of the drawing for Theo. And in 1905, he presented Joe with an oil sketch of the deathbed scene. So he ends up drawing Vincent van Gogh dead basically three times. He does the sketch in situ while he's sitting there. He does another smaller sketch, which I guess he gives to Theo. And then he does a painting um, 15 years later, which he gives to Joe. He's spending quite a lot of time dealing with the death of this artist. And it's like, okay, so when he was alive, what were you doing? Oh, no, no, no. I, there was nothing I could do. Oh, but after he died, there's lots of sketching I need to do. Okay, well, that makes sense. Uh, Nisi says he turned from doctor to artist. Yvonne Phillips asks, where's his beard? So now we go to page 128. And these are the sketches that he, I guess, did. So, so um, that's the sort of deathbed sketch. And, and uh, you can see his eyes have been, his eyes were open, his mouth was also open. I guess he closed his eyes, closed the mouth. You can actually imagine that the scene was actually a lot worse in a way. If, you can imagine if his mouth was open and his eyes were open, it would be kind of more horrific. It would be like, well, this guy really suffered, right? 
And, and then he also did this painting, which, if you ask me, shows you what a shitty artist Dr. Gesher actually is when you look at this painting. Um, uh, but I'm going to talk about this sketch in a moment. What I want you to look at for just for a second is this is the ear of Vincent van Gogh, and it's also the side of his face where his ear was was supposed to be or wasn't supposed to be. You know, in other words, this is the side of his face where the ear was, was mutilated or cut off, right? There you can see he hasn't even written his name there. He's turned, it's gone from Vincent van Gogh, now is V. van Gogh. And uh, just trying to see where he signed it, Paul van Rysel, but I don't quite see it here. Anyway, so, so, um, Martin Bailey makes the point, he says, he's quite surprised that the doctor would paint the mutilated side of Van Gogh's face and not, not the side where his ear still was. So, so in other words, he's just said that, that he painted this out of homage, out of respect, because of his great bond with Van Gogh. So, so now he's painting the sketch. And then in the very next sort of sentence, in a way, is saying, I'm not quite sure why I painted the side where his ear's missing. Um, and that kind of makes sense because it's like, wouldn't you want to show your friend in his in 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 the best light? You know, you wouldn't you wouldn't want to aggravate the suffering, aggravate the picture, you would want to show, you know, kind of the best side to him. Um, and he writes, one might have expected him to have drawn the unblemished side, um, but then he does make the good, uh, quite a good and reasonable point. He said, this could have been logistically difficult because, and I mean, I saw this myself, when you go up to the room, uh, because it's such a small room, the bed is sort of pushed against the side of the room. And so you can sort of anticipate that he was lying um, with his head um, closer to the door side and his feet closer to the other side. So you couldn't kind of be on the other side of Vincent van Gogh. Um, you, 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 you would only have the option of being, uh, excuse me, on one side, right? Um, so, so that sort of seems to explain that. Um, and then the part that's also kind of quite, to me, quite funny, but again, in a troubling way, is uh, Martin Bailey sort of says that he thinks that the doctor may have sort of embellished the ear a bit, like sort of drawn a bit more of the ear to kind of be kind to Van Gogh, to kind of sort of be like, well, although your ear is missing, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put a bit more of your ear there because I don't want to, you know, I, I don't want to sort of make it too unpleasant, your, your death picture, right? That's kind of the argument he says. He says, Dr. Shea may have included more of the ear than was actually present. So you sort of read that and, you know, like I'm looking at it and I'm thinking, um, so, so that's kind of like dishonest. You, you sort of... You, you're trying to represent whether you want to call it the crime scene or the the scenario, but now you're saying, okay, I don't want that to look that way, so I'm going to change that a little bit. So now I'm going to make the ear a bit more because, you know, that's going to... And it's just kind of like already playing games with reality. It's saying, okay, so he'd cut his ear off, but now I'm going to just draw a little bit more of his ear because I don't want it, it to be a disturbing picture. And then he, then Martin Bailey himself sort of kind of backtracks and he says, but I, I don't think he would have done that because he was a doctor and his medical background um, may have, th th these are his words. He says, Dr. Gachet's medical background might have made him reluctant to unduly distort reality. <laughs> so I don't know, like I read that and I'm like, Okay, so I, I kind of want to distort reality here, but I'm a doctor, so I, I can't distort reality. 
and it's just like jeepers. Um, so, so if I wasn't a doctor, I would distort reality. I don't know. It's just pretty crazy. Um, and then, and then, uh, what he does say is true. There has been a lot of debate about um, how much of Van Gogh's ear was missing. And it's part of the craziness that's associated with Van Gogh. If Van Gogh cut off a little part of his ear, then he was a little bit crazy. If he cut off, the more, the more of his ear he cut off, the crazier he was. Also, the more of his ear that he cut off, the more pain he was going through as an artist. So, you know, if he cut off a small piece of his ear, it's like he was just kind of going through a little bit of a crisis. It wasn't really a big deal. But if he was cutting off a lot of his ear, then he was really going through hectic depression and, 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 and all that kind of thing. And in a sort of weird way, the, the amount of his ear that is cut off also um, sort of determines the value of his art. So the picture behind me is like if he cut off just a small piece of his ear, well, then the picture behind me should be worth, let's make it um, $80 million. But if he cut off all of his ear, then he suffered a really lot amount. Now let's make it let's make it $130 million because he really suffered a lot. It's that it's sort of um, this weird calculus based on this belief of pain that he might have had or he may not have had. Um and you, you might laugh at that and say, that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard, but it's literally how they are, how they do look at Van Gogh. And they say, wow, he's a really troubled artist. He really suffered. Um, you know, he suffered for his art, so his art's really worth a lot. If he suffered a little bit for his art, his, his art really wouldn't be worth that much, but he suffered a lot. Um, and the ear, that's a big part of it. You know, he cut off his whole ear. He didn't just cut off a piece of his ear. Um, no, 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 he actually cut off half of his ear. Oh, really, he cut off half of his ear. Okay, well, then that artwork's only worth half what we said. <laughs> I mean, that is literally how the argument goes. Um, so Martin Bailey is saying that the drawing suggests that some of his ear remained, and, and I kind of really disagree with that. Um, if, if you're ear is totally gone. So, so if your ear is completely, you know, if I could take a, a laser or a like a lightsaber and just slice through my ear so that my ear is completely not there and you drew my face from the side, um, you would nevertheless have where the ear used to be. You would have kind of um, sort of rough flesh, if that makes sense. You'd have this sort of uneven flesh and you also have the hole where the original ear hole is so whether the ear is there or not there um, you can't say that if the ear is completely missing and you draw it and then you draw a couple of squiggles you, you can't say oh no no you've drawn the ear back into place the other thing that I think is a valid argument is Dr. Gachet is a shitty artist he is not um, he's not a very good artist so I don't think you can say well, look at what Dr. Gachet painted there. Um, that that that's really an accurate represent. It's not because he's a terrible artist. Um, and, and then uh, he goes on to say um, at the bottom of page 128 that the doctor was a member of the Society de Autopsy Mutuelle, something like that, and. And, and, and then there's, there's this sort of, what's the word? There's a um, assumption, suggestion, question. Because Dr. Gachet was someone who did autopsies, did he do an autopsy on Vincent van Gogh? And then it's like, well, he did have a bullet lodged inside of him. Um, wouldn't you have wanted to remove the bullet? And you must bear in mind, it's a really bloody situation. You know, he's been shot. He basically bled to death. Um, you are going to want to clean up the situation. You're going to want to clean the sheets. You're going to want to clean the body. Um, and while you're doing that, aren't you going to want to sort of, um, you know, kind of find out what happened, take the projectile out and all that kind of thing. Bear in mind... They took the bullet out of Joel Sousa's shoulder within um, 
probably within an hour of him being shot. And so um, these are again Martin Bailey's words. He writes, an important question which has not been adequately addressed, and I agree with that, it's not been properly thought about or examined, is whether Dr. Gachet may have cut an incision to remove the bullet. And I find that really quite weird because once again, it's like, okay, so Dr. Gachet is a doctor. He's part of the society of, of guys who do autopsies. He's a military doctor. He's done lots of, um, you know, military type interventions. And here he is presented with a sort of, yes, one dude who's been shot in the abdomen um, and he's got a bullet inside him. Are you going to take the bullet out? And it's like, we don't know if he did. And it's like, what do you mean you don't know? What do you mean, did they take the bullet out or didn't they? We don't know. And so it's like, it's the same thing of, where was Vincent van Gogh shot? We don't know. What do you mean you don't know? And, and so there's, and also, um, Vincent van Gogh committed suicide with a gun, but the gun disappeared. We don't know where the gun is. What do you mean you don't know where the gun is? It's all of these weird things like, do, do you see what I'm, I'm getting at? Um, then it says, he writes that it's possible that he did take the bullet out, um, but if he did, that would have needed Theo's approval. And, and then he sort of speculates. He says, you know, maybe they would have regarded this foreign object as something that wasn't, it wasn't, it shouldn't have been in his body. So, so it, it would only be the right thing to take it out. But he's speculating. Um, and then he goes on to repeat. He says, quote, it might seem a particularly grisly task to open up the body of a deceased friend. But Dr. Gachet's membership of the Society de Autopsie Mutuelle meant that he would not have felt uneasy about such a procedure. So this is like where it sort of blows my mind. It's like, okay, so this book's written by an art historian, right? And now that Vincent van Gogh's dead, it's like, why don't you just take the bullet out of his body? Um, you know, it wouldn't have been a big deal. Um and he wouldn't have felt uneasy about it at all. So then you say, okay, so when he's dead, it's not a problem taking the bullet out. What about when he's alive? So remember, he took 30 hours to die, and he shot in the ab abdomen, um, and it's it's not like he wasn't shot like with a 9 millimeter. It was a, quite a small caliber uh, gun, which is why he lived as long as he did. So it's like... Can you take the bullet out? No, no, um, I, there's nothing I can do. Bye-bye. Uh, there's nothing I can do. Bye-bye. Um, um, if you need me, I'll be at home. Meanwhile, this is a guy who actually performs autopsies and is a military doctor. And then, as I say, we still don't even know if he did perform the autopsy or not. So, like, the question is, where is the bullet that went into Vincent van Gogh? So you might say... Yeah, I think he committed suicide. Okay, great. So where's the bullet? If you wanted to determine using modern uh, forensic and ballistics, you wanted to determine this is the bullet, this is the trajectory, this is the gun, blah, 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 blah. Why do we not have the bullet or the gun? It's getting a little bit shaky now. It's like um, you've got a doctor there who does perform autopsies anyway, um, he's going to all the trouble to do the sketch. So why are you not doing an autopsy? You're taking all the trouble. You, you end up drawing three different drawings of the dude that's your friend. But so you're not going to bother with what's actually your job, which is also to do autopsies. You're not going to do the thing that you were actually hired to do, which is be his doctor, right? Um, let's just see. Uh, someone says... Not if he's a professional. Nisi says maybe no bullet. No, I'm sure there was a bullet. 
Stephanie says there should have been an autopsy since officers were investigating the shooting. So, yeah, you, you did have the police um, sort of running around. Um, it was the talk of the town. Everyone was aware of it. And so he's also the doctor that's at the center of this. Well, doctor, what do you have to say for yourself? What do you have to say about what's going on here? Um, so anyway, he writes that the doctor shouldn't have felt uneasy about doing the autopsy. And that brings us back to what I said in the previous episode of, so wh why, why are you uneasy about removing the bullet or just helping out Vincent van Gogh? Um, in any event, um, the mayor and three other men signed the death record at 10 a.m. So I think Van Gogh died at dawn on the 29th. And um, probably about four hours later, it was sort of official, um, you know, his time of not his time of death, but a record of his death was um, signed. And then it says, this recorded the legal details noting Vincent's profession as an artist. And then this is the record of death uh, in the book, this particular document over here. Right. Uh, that is the funeral notice over there. Okay, so how many pages have we got left? One, two, three, four. So, um, so now we deal with a, to me, a really tragic part of this whole story. So you might say um, Dr. Gachet was a jerk. You might say, um, you know, uh, they could actually have saved Vincent van Gogh, blah, 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 blah. Well, the, the, comedy of errors, if that's the word, or the tragedy of errors continues after Van Gogh has died in the sense of now, like anybody else, he needs to have a funeral and like anybody else, he needs a hearse and like anybody else, he needs to be buried in a cemetery. And now it's like, no, 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 we're not, we're not, uh, we don't want to be involved with that. Come again. So he's not going to be have a funeral in our church. Forget it. He's, he's not. Uh, he's not, um, you're not. You're not bringing Van Gogh into our church. Okay. We're also not giving you our, our um, the card that we use to move bodies that belongs to the church. Get it somewhere else. Okay. Oh, and by the way, the cemetery as well. You're not using that either. Oh, okay. So, in other words, it's a situation of, it seems to be a situation of two things. They're discriminating against him, it seems, on the basis of three or four factors. The one is possibly he's a Protestant, he's not a Catholic. It's a Catholic church, the church that he painted. He appears to have committed suicide, and in that time that is totally unacceptable and, you know, it's sort of, uh, an abomination. So he's a Protestant. It's an abomination. Also, he's, he's not really French. Van Gogh's kind of like a an outsider. He's from the Netherlands. So it's like, you don't belong here. You're not one of us. You're not part of our religion. You've done something that's ungodly. So we want nothing to do with you. We're not going to even bury you. Uh, you need to get kind of the hell out of here. We need all of this kind of out of our town, right? Now, I want to ask you guys a question. Um, do you think it was more likely that... Remember that Theo's job was sort of on the line. It was sort of on the line, just sort of like a two-way thing. On the one hand, Theo wasn't happy at his job. He didn't feel like he was being paid enough. On the other hand, it was also like he was kind of going to leave his job, but he was sort of not really happy in terms of his career, and, and it, you know, it wasn't like a, 
a happy situation. It sort of worked itself out, but it, it wasn't really a very happy situation. So, so here's a question. Do you think there would have been a greater threat to Theo's livelihood if Vincent committed suicide or if Dr. Gachet shot him? In other words, if you take those two separate scenarios and you say, hypothetically, how would each scenario have affected Theo? And so on the one hand, you say, no, definitely the suicide, because that's, you know, they would have said, well, your brother committed suicide, um, blah, blah, blah. I think it's a little bit different because that's like, that's that, that was his deal, right? Still a scandal, but that was his deal. Now, remember... The argument from the Van Gogh Museum and, and all the scholars is Van Gogh did this to save his brother pain. Now what you're seeing already is when Van Gogh dies, there's like this terrible sort of humiliation and scandal going on. It's like, um, how do you now arrange a funeral even when the church, the local church, isn't allowing you to do it? Oh, no, 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 no. Van Gogh killed himself to save his brother pain. Van Gogh killed himself to save his brother the burden of his life. Oh, okay, so so trying to figure out how to bury him isn't a burden. Anyway, beyond that, you would have kind of ask, okay, so um, which is likely... Now, just think about Van Gogh and Theo in that room together, just the two of them, and maybe they are talking about how they're going to spin this or how they, what they're going to say about this or what the situation is regarding kind of the long term, right? Maybe they're thinking about it, maybe they're not. And all I'm trying to ask you is to think about in terms of Theo, remember Theo will live on. Theo's got a kid. Theo's got a family. Theo's trying to, you know, make money and make a living. Theo has sort of been somewhat successful at that. Vincent van Gogh hasn't. And now you've got the situation where, so if if the story is that Van Gogh committed suicide, um, is that going to affect Theo one way or another? I'm talking about in terms of his job. On the other hand, if Dr. Gachet, if this art dude has shot his brother, do you think the sort of folks at the... Um, company that he works for are kind of going to go, Ew. bearing in mind Dr. Gachet knows all of these other artists, what, what do you think? So Stephanie says it would be much worse for Theo if Dr. Gachet was involved. That's what I think. That's what I think. So... Martin Bailey on page 130 talks about the next formalities, this burial. And um, this is actually signed by Dr. Masri. Um, I just want to ask Stephanie a question I would have liked to have asked her in the StreamYard format. You watched um, Loving Vincent, right? Hey, Jealous, he says, good reason not to have family. Stephanie, you, you watched um, Loving Vincent, right? So in Loving Vincent, the part dealing with the very end, do you remember it being depicted that Van Gogh said, can you take the bullet out of me? Can you remember it being dramatized, you know, that he said, take, take this bullet out of me? Do you remember that? Or not do you remember that? Is that in the documentary? Is that in the dramatization? Yvonne says, Theo and Gasha have business dealings together. So Stephanie says, yes. Yeah. So that's something that um, I can't, I mean, I wrote a book about it. I can't quite remember... I can't quite remember what the source of that is. What is the source of him saying, take the bullet out of me? Is it what Theo said? Is it what Adeline, <clears throat> what 
Adeline Ravu remembered, is it what was passed on to different people? Where, what is the actual source of that? I wonder. <clears throat> because if he did say, take this bullet out of me, then Dr. Gachet said, no, I'm not going to. So if Dr. Gachet is the source, then it's like, Vincent asked me to take the bullet out, but you know, I couldn't do anything. And let's face it, there are certain medical realities that seem to defy logic. I mean, with my own rib that snapped, I would be inclined to think, okay, I think you need to do something about this. I think I need, when, um, when the doctor SMSed me and sent me a x-ray showing this really 10 times worse, it certainly wasn't a fracture, it certainly wasn't a crack. I, I thought his next words were going to be, I booked you into surgery on Tuesday, or you know, you're going to be operated on soon. And I, I kind of was like, wow, so you, you're also going to do nothing. There's nothing you can do. So there are actually some situations where that is really the best treatment, if that makes sense. But I, I don't know whether you can equate a broken rib scenario, one broken rib, with a bullet wound where you say, oh, I've been shot in the chest. Um, we, 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 the best treatment is to do nothing. I really don't think you can put those two side by side. Um, Kitty, stop tearing at the curtains, please. <laughs> the cat's right down here, yeah, but I don't know if she's going to let me pick her up. Hello, Kitty. Hello. <laughs> Oh. Here is Ivy for once. You don't see, get to see her very often. And she's almost throwing the... Um, Ivy, do you want to buzz off? Hmm? Okay. <clears throat> if you sometimes hear a tingling in the background, that's her. Um, so, yeah, so um, that to me really stood out in the, the dramatization of Loving Vincent is him wanting the bullet taken out of him. You can imagine that he would also, um, it's also dramatized in Loving Vincent how Dr. Gachet is acting weirdly. It's like he doesn't say a word, he seems sort of brooding and quiet and he comes and goes with nothing going on. That's also dramatized. And a lot of Loving Vincent is anchored in actual um, uh, statements. It's, it's a true story. Um, the very end of it is, I think, a little bit speculative, but it's really interesting the way. And that is the the story that, that really got me interested in all of this because I was like, wow, I wonder if that's true. And then I went to check and then it turned out to be true. And I was just surprised that there was so much information on the story and that it, as Living Vincent portrays it, it is kind of this detective mystery story, right? Stephanie says, while Theo and Albert Ravu were making arrangements, Dr. Gesha was left to deal with the body, page 129. Yeah, that's quite interesting. That's quite interesting. That's that's a really interesting point you've got there. Um, so for a little while, Dr. Uh, Gachet is alone with the body. So he's not been, you haven't seen him, but now suddenly he's alone with the body, what, what he's actually doing. So um, it also says a coffin was ordered from a merchant near Dr. Gachet's house. It's also quite interesting. The coffin they used to bury Vincent in, comes from near Dr. Gachet's house. Um, 
then yeah, Father Tessier refused to allow the church her, her, um, hers to be used. Um, the day of the funeral was Wednesday, the 30th of July. And this part's quite gross. Hershey, that's the artist that was staying next door to Van Gogh, said that the coffin leaked fluid continuously because the planks hadn't been close enough. And they said eventually that he used carbolic. So that is pretty damn gross. So you sort of had, you know, like I said, it's, it's this, is it a comedy of errors or a tragedy of errors? It just goes on and on and on. Um, Theo bade farewell to his brother's body at 9 a.m. and the, the coffin was surrounded with flowers and it was then sealed. Um, Dr. Gachet brought a large bunch of sunflowers and so there were various, there were quite a few people present for a, for a guy who was supposedly friendless and, you know, um, how can I put it, um, you know, alone. Uh, there were actually quite a few people present. Um, I think it was around about 20 people, something like that, which is quite a lot. Um, then I've also underlined the following, and this is halfway through page 131. Vincent's artist friends decked out the room with his paintings, many of which were not completely dry. So it's like... Um, I thought there was a mystery about which is the last painting. So, so there are paintings at the funeral that aren't actually completely dry. Oh, but now there's a, a great mystery about which is the last painting. So, I mean, for example, is Wheatfield with crows not completely dry? It was painted like three weeks earlier. So, I'm just trying to say, how many last paintings are we dealing with when, I mean, how many paintings do you think couldn't have been completely dry at that point? Right? And so, oh no, we'll conveniently forget that it was that one or that one. Let's make it for, for this gallery exhibition, maybe it's that painting. For this gallery expedition, let's make it that one. And each time a lot of people come around, it's very exciting. Or you could have known from the beginning that painting wasn't finished, the paint wasn't dry, that's the last painting, and we've known it all along, and there, there, there's no new um, breakthroughs. And in a, in a weird way, Van Gogh is, is a little bit like the Madeleine McCann case. Every couple of months, there's like a new suspect or a new, in, in, in Van Gogh's case, it's like this, this artwork could be a Van Gogh. This page could be a letter that he wrote. This blah, blah, blah could be blah, blah, blah Van Gogh. This could be the gun he fired. This could be whatever. And then it suddenly becomes worth millions, and so it goes on and so it goes on. Um, and in that uncertainty, you create whatever you want to create, and it's a kind of a way of making money in a way. Um, Margaret Zabinski says, how does the author know all these details? Well, because quite a few people wrote about them. So Bernard, who was um, uh, a friend both of Gauguin and Van Gogh, I think he wrote a book about it. Um, uh, Theo and Joe would have uh, maybe corresponded with their mother um, in terms of... Um, something about a symbol of the light that he dreamed of finding in the hearts in his artwork. So that's number 13 and number 11. Let's see what the source is for that. So it does provide the sources. Um, chapter 16, funeral. Um, yeah, Ber Bernard to Aurier. So that was a letter written from... Bernard to Albert Aurea, the art dude, and then Hershig also. Um, so interestingly, with footnote 11, it says, a possible incision to remove the bullet might have exacerbated the leakage. That is a... Uh, 
that's a really big point. So what they're finding is that the body is leaking a heck of a lot of blood post-mortem. And so uh, he does make the, the, the point that if there was an autopsy uh, and there was an incision to get the, the bullet, that would have actually caused... Um, oh, okay. <laughs> that would have caused more of this this um, fluid coming out. It's actually a really good point. Forensically, it's definitely an interesting point. Um, so another thing that I've highlighted here is that you had quite a few characters in the story present. Um, you know, um, uh, for example... Um, I think Joe was there, Theo was there, Dr. Gachet is there, um, Bernard is there, and then and then you sort of say, where's where's Gauguin? Where's the dude that that Van Gogh actually lived with in the Yellow House? And clearly Gauguin hasn't gotten over the sort of tiff that they went through. And remember, I've, I've said that I believe Gauguin actually cut Vincent van, van Gogh's ear off, that they argued that he was really not happy, that Van Gogh got so violently drunk that, that um, Gauguin fended him off with a sword and cut off his ear. He actually wanted to kill him, but he ended up cutting off his ear. Well, whatever argument they had when Van Gogh was actually dead, Gauguin didn't even go to the funeral. You kind of got the idea that Vincent liked Goga, respected Goga, wanted to be Goga's friend. Goga sort of um, um, accepted some of these flatteries and compliments until he actually dealt with Goga. You know, he actually sort of, until they'd actually lived together, Goga was like, you know what, I've actually had enough of you. You, you, you are nuts. And Something that was quite unkind was that after Van Gogh died, um, so in other words, like he just died and the funeral happened, he apparently said Vincent was mad. That was his assessment. Faticus, thanks a lot for that super chat. Thanks a lot. Uh, Stephanie says, Gorga is not there. All the artists come out of the woodwork to pay respects to Vincent. So... So that's also definitely quite interesting, just from the, the perspective of relationship dynamics and the backstory to all of this. Fatika says, love, hate going on there, definitely. So um, that's one thing to point out. The other thing to point out is, remember we've sort of said you kind of have the situation of Van Gogh is shot and then Dr. Gachet is really sort of far away. He's in this little town, but he's sort of far away and it's quite hard to get hold of and it kind of takes a long time to get there. And the, the reason they give is, well, he was fishing on the other side of the river, which is another way of saying Van, Dr. Gachet wasn't not there but he was as far away from where he may have been or could have been or should have been or he was as far away from the incident as he possibly could be, but but he was still in the area, right? If you think about it, it's almost like um, if you have a little town and there's a hill next to the town and, and then someone's accused of a crime and you say, where was that guy? No, 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 he was standing right at the top of the hill. In other words, he was as far away as possible from the incident that he could possibly be on, on the top of the hill. And you kind of have that with Dr. Gachet. He's, not, he's fishing and he's on the other side of the river. Um, now, now that Van Gogh's dead, now suddenly he's completely available. He arrives very quickly to draw his little pictures. Um also, when it's a funeral, he's also he's prompt, he's on time. Um, he's the first to arrive at the auberge, and he arrives with his son, Paul. That's quite interesting. The other thing that I've underlined here and I've pointed out is what is written here is um, Martin Bailey's words. He says, 
It is unclear whether his daughter Marguerite and the housekeeper Chevalier attended or if they were too upset. I also find that really, really interesting. Um, it's quite interesting that we know that his son uh, attended the funeral, but we don't know whether his daughter did. And so remember the theory is did Van Gogh um, inappropriately pursue um, Marguerite? Did he do something inappropriate? Did he drink too much during a dinner? Did something happen? And she was at the center of it, and now she's kind of been kept out of the whole thing. We'll handle it, um, right? And, and they handled it from then on. The other thing that I think is quite interesting, and I, if you say, mm, I think it's a bit, I think that I think you're overdoing it, I, I, I will say maybe I am. But maybe Dr. Gachet arrives there first so he can kind of control the narrative. In other words, if someone arrives there before him, then they start saying, do you know where this happened? Did anyone hear the gunshot? Was Vincent really upset? All these things. If he arrives there first, he can say, oh, oh no, I, I can tell you that. Oh, oh, you ask him about that. I can, I can tell you that. I'm just saying maybe that's why he arrives first, so he can attend to all the questions. I do think it's really interesting that Dr. Gachet and Marguerite feature very prominently in the backstory with Vincent, meaning he has encounters with them, he paints them, he, um, you know, when it was, he attends their birthdays, Paul and Marguerite's, she serves food or whatever. But then when Van Gogh's dead, then Marguerite's sort of out of the picture. Right, and then his son comes to the fall. I just find that quite interesting. Um, oh, so actually, Joe wasn't there. Joe was still with her family in Amsterdam, but her brother Andres travelled from Paris, maybe with his wife Annie. Um, so this is what he writes. I think he said that there were about twenty people gathered at the bottom of page one hundred and thirty-one. Um, Bar Martin Bailey sort of acknowledges this idea that 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 it is almost like Van Gogh didn't have any friends or he didn't know anybody or he was alone, right? He says, it's often been said that relatively few people attended Vincent's funeral, but a considerable number of mourners gathered considering the short notice. And considering the fact that it was a quite a scandal, scandalous death as well, in a sense, you know, it's like um, it's not like a proper funeral in the sense of I don't even say proper. It's not like a normal funeral. It's in Paris. It's in a church. It's in this obscure little town, and with all of this thing about okay, these odd circumstances, and yet it's not like few people turn up. Many people turn up. And in spite of many people turning up, Goga still doesn't turn up, which is quite interesting. Okay, so now we're going to go to the very last two pages dealing with this. And I don't think I'm really going to talk about anything on page 132. It just refers to some of the people and the order that they arrived. So it was Pierre Tanguy arrived from Paris. He was the first to arrive from Paris. Then it was Bernard, Vincent's closest French friend. Um, then it was August Luzet, a printmaker, Theo, and it goes on and goes on. It says, Ernest Hoshede, a collector and friend of Dr. Gachet, was also present. So, again, you've got these art, this sort of odd crowd. What, what would have been the difference if it was like Dr. Gachet shot Vincent? If you think now, who would have been present for that? Who would have been present for that funeral? Um, 
so now we go to page 133. This is really the end of this. Um, it says, at 3 o'clock, Theo was sobbing, uh, sobbing about this. Um, and and then they just a, just the route that they took to you know uh, taking the coffin they had to climb over a hill and so on and so on and then this is the part that I've highlighted. They say the the funeral ceremony was was very short, but it was emotionally intense. Quite interesting, and then. Theo wrote this. This is again how you see alternate reality coming to the fore. What is reality and what, why do you have this alternate reality? So Theo writes to Joe that Dr. Geshe spoke beautifully. That's his assessment. It seems a bit over the top if you think about it. Now, I'm, I'm suggesting that Vincent may have said to Theo, look, this is what really happened, but let's put the blame on me, blah, blah, blah. And maybe that happened, maybe it didn't, but irrespective, Theo tells his wife, Dr. Gache spoke beautifully. Dr. Gache was awesome. But was he? I mean, based on what we know and based on what was seen, Dr. Gache didn't seem to be awesome at all. Um, then... This is the part that just, I don't know, it just gets me every time. Um, it's near the bottom of page 133. I'm, I'm quoting from the book. Bernard gave what may have been a more accurate account of the doctor's contribution. Right? So it's like, Theo, why are you not telling what really happened? Uh, you know, it's like Vincent's brother, can you please tell us what happened? What like at the funeral? Can you just tell us? Okay, what did Doctor Gache say? And so Theo says, "It was beautiful." Now it was what the doctor said was beautiful, and so it's like, uh, no, 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 no. That's actually not what happened at the funeral. And so Bernard says the following. He gave a more accurate account, and he said that the doctor gave an extremely confused farewell. And that he also wept so much. And then Dr. Gache also started off describing Vincent as an honest man. And I put a question mark there. It's like, Vincent's an honest man. And why on earth do you need to tell? Um, it's like if I do die, why would you need to say Nick was Nick was an honest person? Is there any reason why you'd think I was not honest? So, you know, saying Vincent was honest, why would he not be honest? Well, if it's Dr. Gachet speaking, couldn't it be Vincent said he committed suicide, believe him, he's honest. Do you get it? Do you get what I'm saying? The most important thing you need to remember is that Vincent is honest. And Vincent said that he committed suicide. He was honest about that. And meanwhile, you've got you've got kind of these dishonesties going on, like, for example, Theo saying Dr. Geshe spoke beautifully, whereas Bernard says that he, he he wept so much that he gave this really confused, it's extremely confused farewell. It's not like he was quite emotional and um, he, he spoke quite beautifully it's like he was so he wept so much that 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 it was an extremely confused farewell it was almost like incoherent now if you apply true crime sense to that the there are a couple of things that you can you can kind of infer the one is you can say that gache was overacting that gache is pretending to be emotional so that it's kind of like a screen. It's kind of like a mask. So it's like um, I'm so I'm so tearful that I um, I can't say anything, and I don't want you to see who I really am. You now it's like you you mask what needs to be said, what should be said, and it's a way of excusing yourself from uh, appearing because you're so emotional, supposedly. 
And you kind of have this whole scenario of Dr. Geshe appearing to be unemotional, unemotional, unemotional over and over again. Um, you know, he appears sort of almost moody and miserable in his self-portrait um, when he's asked for help in terms of the treatment of Vincent's family. He seems to not be moved to, to be very helpful. When Vincent's got a bullet inside him, it doesn't seem to, it's like, there's nothing I can do. In other words, he's not moved to like, oh, I'm, I'm really um, worried about this guy. I really want to help him. I'm a doctor. What can I do? I'm, re I'm really I'm excited and caught up in this drama. I've got to help. Instead, it's like it, it, it seems to be almost like a psychopath, right? He's not doing anything. He's not acting in the right way. Suddenly at the funeral, and also, you know, he sketched just all of these sketches by the deathbed, just like, mm, okay, so he's died. I'll close his eyes, draw the picture. Suddenly at his funeral, he's the first to arrive, and now he's crying uncontrollably. There's a bit of a mismatch there. And it's an extremely confused farewell, but the one thing that he does emphasize is Vincent's honest. And it goes further to say um, that the doctor broke down, that the doctor actually sort of broke down. It's almost like that he couldn't finish his speech and, and then he sat down. And so it almost sounds like, well, Shane, the doctor was really traumatized. He was really a good friend of his. So why weren't you there when he died? If you were so traumatized and sad and you're breaking down and you're crying, you weren't even there when the guy died. You took a long time to get there when he was shot. You didn't do anything when he was shot. Um, and But now at the funeral with all of these people, now you're sobbing and you're showing how what a great guy you are that you really cared about your friend now suddenly you're this friend um the other thing that is quite crazy is so dr gachet is incoherent and he's emotional and he's crying but that doesn't stop him from taking like a dozen of van gogh's paintings as payment saying okay you know what i am vincent's doctor i did treat him so all of these paintings in this cafe, I'm going to take his payment for the work that I did. You know, I did really good work. I helped him there and there and there. Um, actually, didn't really help him at all, but I'm going to take all of these paintings as payment. And he took um, like a huge amount of his of the paintings that were at the funeral. And and Theo was sort of like, well, you know, you were his doctor. What what can one say? Um, Theo probably may have felt, well, you know, I don't really have um, much more space in my apartment. But it may also have been a kind of a bribe, like, um, you know, like Theo said to, or Vincent said to Theo, Dr. Gachet did this. And now giving Dr. Gachet the artwork sort of makes up for whatever caused Dr. Gachet to do what he did. He had exactly the same thing happening with Gauguin. Gauguin took some of Van Gogh's art when he left the yellow house, he took the sunflowers. I don't think he asked. I don't think he said, can I take these sunflowers? He just took them, right? And um, that I also think was sort of like, okay, I did something to upset you. You've taken that as a kind of a um, payment for almost like restitution of, of whatever. Um, so, so, just when you put all of this stuff together, it's not one little incident that stands out. It's, a lot, it's dot, 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 and then those dots don't stop. They keep going. On and on and on and on. Um, and that's, that's really the end of my analysis on the funeral. And this is where we go into the, the true territory of true crime. And I'm going to be changing the painting behind me back to the typical true crime rocket science um, sort of logo. Um, because now we're going out, out of the Van Gogh history in a way to the, the question, was it suicide or murder, right? And as I say, you might say... Um, 
I think you've written too many true crime books. Everything you you're seeing is is um, is a crime. Well, the the this this book was written I think in October last year, right? Just a couple of months ago. And in this really recent book, they're talking about um, is it suicide or murder, right? And the reason why this chapter is really interesting is. And, and it, it deals with the title to all of the all of the um, episodes I've done so far. Is does an expert art historian um, does he have the ability to to sort of be a Sherlock Holmes in a case like this? Can can an artist <clears throat> can an art historian who knows the dates when paintings were painted and he knows all of these details? Do they know much about true crime? Can they apply true crime? standards of analysis um, in a way that's sensible, reasonable, and makes sense, right? And that's really the issue we're going to deal with in the next episode. We're going to deal with his, um, it's quite a long chapter. Um, it's one, two, three, four, five, five, Five arguments. So Martin Bailey makes five arguments why Vincent Van Gogh committed suicide. And by now, um, you guys need to, you guys should be in a position where where I'll, I can present his argument and you need to be able to say, I actually believe that that's that's actually totally reasonable. You know that that is the mainstream version that totally makes sense, and I agree with that. Or you're going to go based on the education that we've gotten, based on this the, the, a more balanced view, a more a more um, uh, uh, what's the word, a more complete comp comprehensive view of this. That argument actually doesn't hold water. And there are five of them. So, so really what you're going to do in the next episode is say, these are an art expert's five arguments for why Van Gogh committed suicide and not murder. And out of those five, and be honest, out of those five you need to say, oh, I accept that one. I accept that one. I don't accept that one. I, and, and then decide of those five, because that this is really where the rubber meets the road, where you say we've not dealt with all the information. Now the art expert's making kind of like his legal case. He's kind of make or really his narrative case. He's kind of saying this is the information we have. This is the evidence we have. This is my position, and this is where we say, based on what we know, based on what we've seen, based on logic and uh, true crime rocket science, I guess. Um, I agree or I disagree. And so you've got an opportunity to look at these, these five arguments and decide how many of them you buy, how many of them you accept. And that's kind of a credibility contest because you're either going to say, you know what, he makes complete sense. Each one of those arguments are completely legitimate and you are full of crap. <laughs> you might say that. You might say, I think you are totally, you've really missed, missed the boat in this case. You know, you, you, were, you were great in that case, but in Van Gogh, you're completely wrong. And that's fine. If, if you see it that way, that's fine. Um, the, the thing that I've been trying to do is show you the information in, in a complete way. And then I really want you to make up your, I don't want to be the one saying, I force, I, you know, I'm going to twist your arm. You've got to agree with what I'm saying. I want you to um, come to your own conclusion based on evidence, just like you have in a court case. And and um, you're either going to be in the one position or the other. You're either going to be in the position where you say, you know what, the story that we've been led to believe, the story we've been told all this time about Van Gogh, is true. He was troubled. He cut off his ear. He was suicidal. Um, he didn't want to be a burden to his brother, blah, 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 right? In other words, everything that we know 
is true and it's no big deal. It's what we know, right? That's the one side of it. The other side is what we've been led to believe for over 130 years isn't true. And the truth is actually quite different. It's one of those two. And so we're certainly going to see which one that is. Uh, let's look at some of your comments. Fatika says, interesting. Hey, Jealousy says, imagine a doctor starting to cry trying to read your test results. Uh, Stephanie says, the last paragraph brought tears to my eyes. The last paragraph of, 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 the, of the funeral chapter. Well, that is definitely quite touching that you were so emotional about it. Um, I, um, I've done a little bit of crying <laughs> in the last couple of days. It's not quite as bad as it sounds, but um, page 133. Oh, okay, so that is the, the end of that. Um Nisi says, thank you, Nick. Your Van Gogh chat is wonderful and enlightening. Makes my day brighter and listening to you. I really like the yellow that you've used there, Nisi. Uh, says, thanks to Steph and the group as well. Um, hey, Jealousy, thanks a lot for that. Yvonne Phillips says, I'm ready to hear the five points next time and make my final decision. Yvonne, you are always a very um, rational mind in our group so I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing what you say and what you think um, I'm just trying to think which episode we should have Stephanie on as well um, because there's a really long chapter dealing with I think it's the chapter after that one dealing with Dr. Gachet and his son um just trying to see what where it is. It's called Father and Son. It's chapter 20. And it goes from page 161 to hundred and seventy-three. So I, I kind of feel like I want to do that chapter with Stephanie. I don't know how Stephanie feels. So Stephanie, you must let me know if you want to do the suicide or murder chapter with me or the father and son chapter with me. Um, the, the, the thing with the, the suicide or murder chapter is I don't want to sort of, I want to kind of present it in a way. I don't want to be like manipulating you or I kind of just want to be saying this is his position and then kind of get the feedback. I don't, I don't kind of want to be sort of reading something he says and then kind of um, – laughing at it or undermining it. I literally want to be like, this is what he says about that. What What is your position? Yay or nay? This is what he says about that. Yay or nay? So um, maybe maybe you should, you should be involved in the father-son thing just because it's very, it's a, it's, a longer, it's a longer chapter as well. I don't know what you think about it. Um, Stephanie says, I think you should do the next one on the decision-making one. Okay. I think so too. So, yeah, I, I said I've been crying a lot. <laughs> it actually sounds uh, a lot worse than it is. Um, certainly not been like, hoo, 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 but um, have any of you watched the series The Last Kingdom on Netflix? Have any of you uh, been been watching that? Um, it's about Uhtred of Bebenbar. Have, have any of you seen it? What's going on? Chat seems to be taking a while to come through. Hey, Jealousy says, I think of Vincent when I paint. So anyway, this particular series, it, it deals with this um, warrior 
And I don't know, I don't know why it um, like literally tears are kind of going down my cheeks. I think it's because it's because he's a Vincent van Gogh like character in the sense that he he's worked so hard, he deserves so much, he's done so much. Um, he's at, at one point quite early on in the fifth season and the final season. Um, someone actually says to him, you, you've, you've endured so much pain. And I don't know, there's something about that particular series that um, acknowledges the, the heroic struggle in, 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 um, in the human story. I mean, obviously it's set in um, sort of the medieval times, but it acknowledges the... Uh, the the depth of 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 struggle and the length and breadth of 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 a particular um, you know story through you know someone's history and you don't kind of see that often you don't kind of often get that depth of character in in a story you know where it's I mean obviously it's based on on history. And it's um, big things are happening, their battles and so on. But, you know, there's something about, I don't know, um, being finally acknowledged, you know, because it doesn't happen, being finally acknowledged for something that you did, so something that you've been fighting for, um, um, that, that obviously resonates with me. I mean, I'm not like um, blubbering with tears, but, but um, it definitely makes me really, really emotional, obviously, because it resonates with me. Um, Yvonne says, it is so violent, should I keep watching? You can always look away when the fountains of blood do their thing. But I mean, they actually edit it in a way that you don't really see anything. Um, <laughs> Nisi says, my hubby gets choked up and he's not the emotional type. Yeah, I mean, I just find it a fantastic series. In fact, uh, my girlfriend and I um, sort of, when we met, th that was like the first series we watched and it, it sort of knitted us together in a way. And um, we binge watched the fifth series and it's unfortunately now over, um, but I probably will watch it again. So anyway, on the one hand, I've been crying um, but on the other hand, today I watched um, The Bubble. Have, have any of you guys seen The Bubble on Netflix? And uh, there I, I really couldn't stop laughing. And the kind of laughter where, where I, I was worried I was actually going to um, hurt my rib. It was like, you know that feeling when you shouldn't laugh and that makes – it 10 times funnier, you know, that feeling where you, you would stop yourself from laughing and that makes the joke just 10 times or 100 times more compelling. Um, while Stephanie says, I've seen nothing but robotics competitions. Um, Fatika says, who's in it? The, the, the couple of fairly well-known actors in it, I just can't really think of any of their names. Um but but that was a really weird position to be in today, where where it, I was laughing so much that 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 I was trying not to hurt my rib. Um, quite weird. Let me put the trailer up for you so you guys can see it. Although the trailer is not very funny. Uh, David Duchovny is one of the actors. Um, some of them are familiar, but I, I don't necessarily know what their names are. But um, I don't know. I found it really, really funny. Stephanie says, I'll be MIA again all weekend. Well, I must say it's frustrating. When I look on my phone, the story, story night's perfectly aligned behind me. It's like perfectly in frame. And then when I look... Behind me, if I look at the screen, um, it's 
it's um, the angles are all wrong. It's quite quite unfortunate. So what makes the bubble quite funny is it sort of pokes fun at the whole idea of the pandemic. It sort of deals with um, uh, actors who are in a situation where they keeping the series alive to just you know uh, and and um, and then they forced to isolate. But it, it really makes a parody out of it, and it, it's quite lighthearted. I found it a lot of fun. So. Um, so really, that's my story. I don't know when I'm going to do the next the next sort of chapter of Van Gogh's finale. Um, I might do it tomorrow. Um, I would prefer to kind of try and do it, not not have it like weeks apart. So so I'll try and do it tomorrow, or the next day, but certainly this week. Um, but this is where the rubber meets the road. This is where we say, okay, this is this is what happened. This is this is literally what is very likely in this case and and um, it's important to kind of reach that point Fatica says now that is a comedy Stephanie says, I better, I better read the father-son one and prepare. Yes, you will. There's a lot of, I've highlighted a lot there already. Stephanie, have you not actually finished this book? So the father-son one, I'll show you. These are some of the highlights I've made. It's uh, pretty bloody. Um, here's, here's some more. As you can see, it's pretty bloody with highlights. But yeah, he's actually standing by the grave, uh, Dr. Gachet's son. I've actually stood there myself. And one of the things you don't realize is just beyond those graves, so Theo and Vincent are sort of next to one another, just beyond that wall, if you look over the wall, is a wheat field. And there are crows in that wheat field, like even today. So when, um, before I went to Orvez, before I went to France, I spoke to an artist who'd been there, an artist, and I asked her, I said, um, are there crows in the wheat field? And, and she couldn't remember, and, and I, I kind of thought, wow, didn't you pay attention to that? But obviously different people pay attention to different things. Uh, Stephanie says, no, I don't like to go too far ahead, wanted to keep fresh in my mind. That that does make sense. So anyway, I want to recommend those of you who want to have a good laugh, watch The Bubble on Netflix. I hope you do laugh. I did. Um, I hope you do find it funny. Um, and those who want to have a just enjoy a good story, if you haven't seen The Last Kingdom, you should really check it out. Um, that's really it. I, I don't, don't really know. Um, there's not really anything else I want to deal with. Um, do you guys have any questions or comments? Otherwise, I'm going to be signing off. Um, we've had a fairly good turnout here. Um, 44 people in chat right now, 44, 40 people watching. Um, it's not bad for... 20 minutes notice um, and it sort of feels like a lecture a sort of a, the amount of people you'd have in a lecture which is quite cool uh, hey jealousy asked how old was Vincent I think he was 37 years old um, I think his brother was 34 Stephanie says, I appreciate you finishing the series. Yeah, so there's likely to be two more episodes. And then we may have some bonus content dealing with things like the gun 
And um, I don't know, I'll see how I feel, but um, we, we may even go back way back in time and deal with some of the very first letters he wrote. But it kind of depends on whether you feel like addicted to Van Gogh. If you feel like, no, no, I want to, I want to know more about him. I want to, let's, let's get into, get really get into it, you know? So, so we'll see. Um, Stephanie says, yes, the letters, the letters definitely are, I think the reason Van Gogh is so well known and so famous because it really fleshes him out as a character, as a person, in a weird way, you know, when you look at this face, um, it, it, it kind of seems like a, um, almost a moody, grim, tragic fellow. But when you read, um, when you read his letters, you see that he's, he's actually quite a sensitive emotional, talented, intelligent, um, passionate person who's inspired, and, and, and that's something that is inspiring. I mean, to me, to me, um, don't laugh when I say this, but um, of, of all the art and all the artists in the world, I, I, I wouldn't say Van Gogh's my favorite artist, but if you ask me which artwork do you think is the best artwork in the world um, I, I think I would say this one Starry, Starry Night I just find it um, incredibly imaginative as, as does everybody else I mean I don't think I'm special in that regard I just find it um, this beautiful combination of magic, magic and reality and, and the fact that he painted it while he was at the asylum the fact that he painted something so astonishing when he was in this bleak setting is just so awesome to me um, so so th this to me is um, arguably the finest painting that a human being has ever painted just in my opinion and um you know, I love it. I just think it's absolutely um, awesome. Um, and the backstory around it is, is awesome as well. And I'm not alone in that. A lot of people also think that's awesome. And that's also what's so amazing about it is, is that he touched a nerve with everybody. You know, there's, there's a quality to this that's, that's, that's almost like it's moving. There's a quality to it that is like it's a fairy tale, like it's this beautiful little um, hamlet. Um, but there's another quality that it's, it's it's sort of haunting and in a way mysterious, and, and in another way it is it is what it is. It's just this little town under the stars. Fatica says magic and Maya. Yvonne says... Um, such a great channel. Thanks a lot for that. Stephanie says, I had Starry Night hanging in my dorm room in college. That is so awesome. That's really awesome to hear. So it has that, you have that connection to your youth and to your formative years. And that, that's really quite amazing. Um, Stephanie, yeah, I saw your question earlier. Why is Vincent clean shaven in his death sketch? I don't know. Um, I don't. I don't know whether he always had a beard. There are some self portraits that he did where he doesn't have a beard. In fact, there's some self portraits where he doesn't have any hair on the top of his head either. Where he sort of shaved. So maybe shaved. Um, if you take that question a little bit further, you could theoretically say that he he cleaned himself up for a for a for a dinner date, you know, um, because uh, Adeline Revu does say that he was kind of scruffy looking, that he was not that well dressed. So the, if he was shaved, unless again it's Dr. Gachet's crap drawing, 
if he was shaved, maybe he had sort of groomed himself for a, a Sunday night date or Sunday night dinner. You know, he'd sort of taken a little bit of care in his appearance. So um, it's a little bit difficult because it's not a photo and we don't know if Dr. Gachet's execution was so crap that he just forgot to put that there. It's difficult to say. Uh, Fatika says, I'm going to get a print. Uh, Fatika says, I know very little about Van Gogh, no doubt. We all identify with Van Gogh, certainly in some ways. But um, if Fatika says, if you'd been following the whole series, uh, he's not quite as tragic a figure as many people think he was. For example, he had um, a fair amount of money. Um, he was doing pretty well in the last two months of his life. He was painting a picture a day in the last 70 days. He um, had quite good relationships with his brother and, you know, some of the people that he knew in Paris. And his art was going well. And um, I think the part that's not acknowledged is the syphilis and also his um, behavior towards women, I think, is, is less less acknowledged than it probably should be. Stephanie says, and I studied him in art history but was misinformed, glad to learn the truth. Stephanie says, upon his death, his paintings were still wet. He was busy, busy painting, yeah. And remember, he used the style where he put a lot of paint, it's like very thick paint. So it would take that paint quite a while to, to dry. Um, Yvonne says they may have cleaned and washed and shaved him for burial. True, but I don't think that would have been the case when Dr. Gachet was sketching him. Um, I think that sketch was pretty pretty early on, but it is a good point. Margaret Zabinski, good to see you here. She says, Jacksonville, Florida is advertising a Van Gogh light show exhibit coming in September. Well, I hope you're going to attend that. Um, Margaret, have you watched Loving Vincent? By the way, Stephanie, any comments about Loving Vincent, any thoughts about it? Like, I know you've watched it. Any um, any special comments you want to make about that? Oh, thanks a lot for that. Do you have any, like, do you want to give us a quick review? I wish you could hear it in your own words. I'm sure we will when we do the stream yard thing, but is there anything you want to say? Did you find the talk about Marguerite Gachet, quite interesting, the way that that was brought up and the way that she's kind of going to defend them not having a relationship and, and all that. Didn't you find that quite interesting? And also Dr. Masri, where Dr. Masri kind of gets onto his knees and he shows this is the crazy trajectory and what do you make of that? Uh, oh, Faticus says, I saw that light show in Buffalo. Really? So, Faticus, you, you've been to uh, a, the, the whole Van Gogh uh, light show exhibit. That's pretty amazing. I haven't even been to one yet. I, I actually need, I think, to make a episode that I'm not going to crime con because I put it up in a, as an April Fool's joke and it seems like 90% of people think that I'm really going and Stephanie and one or two other people were almost like they're going to change their plans and their itineraries to go. And I would hate them to go then be like, where's Nick? Oh, April Fool's joke. Well, now it's not so funny, you know. Uh, Fatigas just uh, took my 89-year-old mom. Um, Nisi says my... Is it 88 year old artist father went in Arizona and loved it? Oh, okay. Yeah, jokes on you. 
Stephanie says, I found the series made more of a case for Dr. Gachet being involved than what they were portraying with a teenage boy. Yeah. But did you notice, Stephanie, did you notice how, especially in the last 10 minutes, they take you into the possibility and motive of Dr. Gachet being involved, being the perpetrator, the sort of take you along that path. And then just before the, the film ends, they, they sort of make a U-turn and they go, no, 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 we don't really know what happened. Um, you know, blah, 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 blah. He was an unhappy guy. Did you notice that? Did you notice how they sort of U-turned on their own sort of the thing that they were doing? Yeah, it was odd. Okay, guys, I've got to get working on um, uh, another chapter of Treachery, the five-month search for Casey, Kaylee Anthony. I've got to do chapter five, I think, so I'm going to sign off here. Thanks, everyone, for... Um, being present and for your comments. It's been quite an enjoyable episode 12. Episode 13 is going to be um, definitely worth worth checking out. So watch this space. Um, I'll try and give you more notice than I gave you for this one. Um, but uh, certainly keep your eyes peeled. Um, it'll be around about um, this time probably maybe a little bit earlier, um, but uh, keep your eyes peeled for that. Yvonne says, no more April Fool's jokes. To be honest, I actually saw an April Fool's on another channel, on Scott Reich's channel, and I thought, what can I come up with that's, um, yeah, what can I come up with? And um, it kind of backfired because kind of backfired, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Ooh, sorry, excuse me. Hey, Jealousy says, cancel the hotel reservation. Yeah, Stephanie, I know you said you got teary when you realized it was an April Fool's. <laughs> My husband was like, I'm so sorry you were so happy for 20 minutes. Okay. Well, you know, uh, hopefully we get there. You know, I did contact CrimeCon. They said, sorry, we're full. We don't have any slots open. Um, who knows? Um, maybe next year, maybe 10 years from now. Who knows? We'll see. Um, but, yeah, I, I did think that was also quite funny. It's sort of funny, not funny, isn't it? Yeah, okay. So, guys, thanks a lot for being here. And um, as I said, I'll see you guys next time for episode 13. It's really going to be an interesting one. Uh, thanks for your super chats. Thanks for all the members who are here. And um, have a good rest of your week. See you guys later. Ciao.